Na, na. All right, hope you're doing okay. It's another really great day. I'm a bit tired today, but um, hope it will be a blessing. Um, let me just connect first on Facebook. <clears throat> uh -huh. Just a minute, just a minute, just a minute. Today I'll be speaking about apostasy, apostasy or the great falling away. Have you realized that people are falling away nowadays and uh, you can't really tell what is what? People is like the, it's like another world, another church, another message. And um, we're trying to see as much as we can to try and tell people that they don't fall away. Post uh, C. I'm, I'm very, I'm very poor when it comes to typing and I'm speaking. I don't know if uh, even you, you have this kind of thing whereby you cannot multitask. For me, it's very difficult to multitask. So anyway, uh, today I'm speaking about apostasy. What uh, we also hear is called apostasia. All right, and uh, I hope it is be a big, big blessing to all of us and we'll be able to hear and get to understand Mm, what's happening in the world today, especially in this year, 2021, so many people are still mixed up and they're asking, <laughs> what is happening to the world now? What's really going on with the world? Because we cannot, we cannot really say oh, what's going on. Everybody's confused and uh, things are going in a different way. And others are just uh, asking, is Jesus coming? Is he, are these the last days? Is this the final moments or what actually is happening? So um, I want to tell you one thing that we are purely living in the last days. These are really, really last days and uh, people are falling away from the truth and uh, they don't want to hear the truth. They, they want to continue doing uh, things which are not right. And uh, you find so many people, they they don't realize these things. It's like they are realizing a little bit. And remember when Jesus said that uh, narrow is the way and few find this way. So are you on the way? Have you found that way? Do you really understand what's happening? So today I will be speaking about apostasy. That is the great falling away. People are falling away from something. And uh, we're going to understand what is really this uh, great falling away. So um, we are going to be talking about the end times, the end times. This is the end of the church age. Remember the end of the church age, the church age ends with the rapture. It doesn't end with the end of the world. Okay. The end of the world will be after Jesus comes back. But right now we're talking about the end times, the, 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 the end of the church age. That's exactly what you're talking about. So we have, um, uh, when you look at the King James Bible, uh, you can be able to see the word last days, it's uh, mentioned about eight times. And also last time is mentioned about four times in the King James Bible. Latter days, latter days, okay, it's about 11 times. And also latter time, it's a uh, one time. So um, it's something that we also need to understand what, you know, all that. And of course, falling away has been mentioned once. First of all, let's see which verse talks about falling away, what exactly we'll be speaking about today. So this is in the book of 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. It says, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Which day? The day that will be gathered together, the day of, uh, you know, our Lord Jesus, uh, 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 the day of Christ, actually it's called the day of Christ, huh? Uh, that day will not come. Let me just uh, first start from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him, that you be not soon shaken. You see, so many people are shaken. They were, they were scared. They were afraid. And they were wondering, are we in the last days? What's really happening? And Paul was saying, don't be soon shaken in mind or be troubled neither by spirit nor by word, nor by later 
as from us as the day of Christ is at hand. Why is he saying several things? Look here, he's saying, do not be shaken in mind because sometimes our mind shake us so much or be troubled neither by spirit. You see, there are people who say, the spirit told me this, the spirit told me that. Don't be shaken by spirit, no. No, by word. Remember, the prophets were speaking the word of God. They were preaching the word of God all through uh, from Genesis uh, up until now we see the epistles of Paul coming. All that was the word which was spoken to the prophets, okay? So don't be shaken by any word, nor by letter. You see, Paul was giving the epistles, the letters. So even this letter should not even shake you. So he has cut across the three uh, dimensions of the Bible. We have the spirit whereby we see um, so, so much activity of the spirit, especially in the book of Revelation. There's a lot which is, you know, people are scared and the spirit showed me this and the spirit told me this and people get scared about that. He also said that not by letter, what the letters, the epistles of Paul, or even the word, you know, the word which is spoken by the prophet, that should not scare you as if the day of Christ is at hand, okay, as if the rapture is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means, okay, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, listen to what he's saying, that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, you see, he's assuring us that day, the day of the of the rapture will not come until there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, the rapture will not come until a falling away comes first. So we have to ask ourselves, what is this falling away? What are people falling away from? If you're falling away, then you're, it means you're falling away from somewhere where you are, you know, you are standing somewhere and then you fell down to something. And uh, for me, what I believe is that people will be falling away from faith and falling away from grace, you know. Uh, falling away from faith, it basically means the faith that they once had in the gospel, they will fall away from that. They, 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 they had some faith. They were, they were focusing. They, they used to believe that it is the blood of Jesus which saves. All of a sudden, people will start believing in other doctrines and other things that you cannot really tell where they are from. And also people will fall from grace, okay? From grace is they will come out from a point where they could have been saved. You see, there are so many lukewarms in the church nowadays who are just in the church for the sake of, you know, it's Sunday, let's go to church, let's do whatever we have to do. So there are this kind of lukewarms who are in the church. So this kind of people who are in the church, they were in a place whereby they could have been saved if it were possible, but they fall away from that grace through maybe something that they're going to do, which will make them not be able to be saved anymore. And we'll come to that and uh, we'll continue there. Let, let, me, let me just show you something here. First, you have to ask ourselves, if people are falling off from faith, so faith that they are believing now, what they are believing, is it a different faith from what we are supposed to believe in? So in actual sense, what are we supposed to believe in? Now, this is a simple childlike way of explaining salvation. For those who don't know how to be saved, I always like to repeat this. Those who don't understand how someone is to be saved. You see, there are so many people in church nowadays, they just tell you believe or, uh, you know, get born again or repent. They don't explain to you how, how is the process? What am I really repenting? How am I doing the repentance? How am I doing? You see, so today I want to explain to you in a childlike way what you should believe in. When the Bible says repent, repent. Repent. What does the word repentance mean? The word repentance comes from the, the root word metanoia from, from Greek. And the metanoia basically means change of mind. All right. So salvation is all about change of mind. It's not about what you have done. It's not about your good works. It's not about something. It's not about uh, me telling you, stop sinning, stop uh, beating people, stop lying, stop being corrupt. No, I'm not telling you that. Basically, salvation is change your mind from unbelief to belief. You never believed in Jesus Christ in the first place. So start believing in him right now. Or maybe you're believing in some idols, you're believing in some things. Stop believing in those things and then believe in Jesus Christ. Salvation is about stop what you are putting your trust in and put your trust in something else. 
or change your mind from one thing to another. Remember in the Bible, we see so many, um, about 32 different Bible verses where God repented and God repented from this. God repented from destroying um. Uh, from destroying Nineveh. God repented for what he wanted to do to the to Israel. God repented this. God Was God a sinner? No. He was basically changing his mind. He was saying, I was going to destroy these people. I'm not going to destroy them anymore. I'm going to give them, you know, some more time. So repentance is all about a change of mind. And now what happens when you change your mind from unbelief to belief? Now, immediately you change your mind from unbelief to belief, then the Holy Spirit comes inside you. He gives you a new heart and a new mind. The moment you have a new heart and a new mind, the old is gone and the new has come. You become a new creature. You start doing different things. If you are a new person with a new mind and a new heart, are you going to do things the same way you used to do? No, because you have a new heart and a new mind. And that is exactly why you see a born again Christian does not continue doing sinful things. Why? Because they have a new mind and they have a new heart. So the one who is in you is who is the Holy Spirit is the one who is directing you and telling you this is good. Do this one. No, don't go this way. Come this way. He, the Holy Spirit convicts you to righteousness. He convicts you. He does not condemn you. If you see someone condemning you, or if you feel maybe you have lied to someone and then you hear something telling you, ha, ah, get you now, you're going to hell tomorrow because you, now that's the devil. The Holy Spirit, he does not condemn you. He convicts you unto righteousness. You see the difference? He convicts you unto righteousness. So if he's convicting you to righteousness, it means that he's telling you, don't do this. You've been saved. Do what is right. Walk in this way. So He'll give you a new heart and a new mind, and you'll start doing different things. And that's why the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians 2, 8, 9, it tells us, for by grace are you saved through faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. It is the gift of God. Let me, let me just read it so that I may read it exactly the way it is. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. Look at this. It is faith, not of yourselves. But it is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift. It is a gift of God. God gives you, he saves you by grace. What is grace? Getting what you don't deserve. You did not deserve to go to heaven. You did not deserve to be forgiven, but he forgave you nevertheless. That is what we call grace. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There are some people who will say, it is because I stopped, uh, you know, beating people, stealing. I stopped fornicating. I stopped these things. Now I think I am saved. I think uh, I said that prayer. I think I gave something in the church. I think I was a good man. I've been living a good moral upright uh, life. You see, that's, I, I, I tend to think I'm saved. No, that is your works. And your works cannot save you. Your works can never save you. It is grace which saves you through faith. Grace is you get what you don't deserve. God has mercy on you. And then he saves you through you believing in him, through faith, okay? Now, I'll come to faith in just a bit. Now, let's see verse 10. After you've been saved through faith, not of any works. There is no works which is saving you, nothing. It is Faith plus nothing. Now, after you've been saved, look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus and to good works which God has before ordained that we should walk in them. So we are God's workmanship created unto good works. Now, why are we created unto good works? Because the ultimate goal of God, why he created us, he created us for his own pleasure so that we can make him, uh, we can worship him, we can have a relationship with him. So if you think that you are created for your own pleasure to make yourself happy and to do whatever you want to do, then you're out of the way of salvation. You don't really understand. But the moment you have understood what, why God created me and how we fell from the time of Adam, and after we fell, we, it happened the way it happened. And uh, you see, we were sinful all through. But God had mercy on us and he sent Jesus to come and die for us. And then now it's all about us believing in what Jesus did for us. And then we get saved. 
When you understand that, then now you have a new heart and a new mind. And then all of a sudden you start doing good works. You start having a good testimony. You start, uh, you know, preaching to others. You start telling people about Jesus. You start reading the Bible and you can see. And when you read one verse, it's like popping out. and You can be able to see these things. And, and, and really God is doing a great thing in your life. So we don't, we don't basically... Uh, uh, get saved through doing good things. No, for those who say that uh, because you're doing so many good things, that one is saving you, you're lying to yourself. Actually, let me tell you something very funny. You can be saved, you change your mind and you get saved and you go to a bank and you know, you're stealing with a gun with other people, other thugs, and all of you, you are gunned down and you, you will go to heaven and they will not go to heaven because you had a changed mind. You had repented. But now let me tell you something. Why do you think Christians then don't just go and carry guns and steal from people and do all these things? It's because they have a new heart and a new mind. And now the old has gone, everything has changed and you don't feel the urge of doing these things. Even if you're in freedom, we can do whatever we want, but you cannot do these things because I can't go uh, doing wrong things out there because the Holy Spirit is in me. And he has changed the way I used to think and the way I used to behave and the way I used to feel. That's why you see people don't do these things. It's so easy. Salvation is so easy. It is, it's the only thing that you don't need to do anything. God just tells you believe, all right? So now let's come to the point of belief. If we have to believe, then what are we believing in? You see, there are people who are here, you have to believe to be saved. Believe, believe. So you have to ask yourself, what am I believing in? The Bible tells us, unless you believe the gospel, you can never be saved. So what is the gospel? First, we have to ask ourselves, what's the gospel? The gospel is basically good news. So good news about what? It is good news about what Jesus did for us. So what did Jesus do for us? You see, I'm trying to bring you to that point. So what did Jesus do for us? Jesus died for our sins. So if Jesus died for our sins, what really happened? Why did he have to die for our sins? That is a question that you have to ask yourself because man became a sinner. Remember, Adam, when he was in the Garden of Eden, he was told, do not do A, B, C, D. Do not eat from that tree. And then he said, oh, I'm going to do that. And then he went and ate. And when he ate from that tree, immediately the seed of sin came into him. And now that one already separated him from God. But God had grace had mercy on him and he had some grace on him. So because God has set some rules and he has said, whoever sins, he must die. God is a just God. He does not, there's no way you can show love without justice. If you have said, whoever will do this, this is what will happen. For you to show love, then there must be justice. So God could not just have woken up and said, okay, I forgive you. It's okay. God does not forgive. Now, get this point very clear. For those who are about to bash me because I said God does not forgive. Now, let me tell you one thing. If God could have forgiven Adam and Eve, then it could have meant he was not a just God. He's not a true God. He's a corrupt God because he sets some rules and then all of a sudden he breaks the rules. But now God has said, whosoever shall sin, he will die. So there had to be something which had to be done for something to die. Either the person who has done that, he has to die or something else has to die in part of that person. Are you, are you seeing the point? So now what really happened is when Adam and him, they, if they sinned, uh, they fell away from God and God had grace on them. They, they were supposed to die, but he had favor on them, mercy on them. And he said, instead of them dying, let me get an animal and kill it on their behalf. And the first death, the first death that we are seeing in the Bible was done by God himself. He killed an animal and clothed their sin. You remember Adam and Eve, they were sinful. He clothed them with the animal skin. That animal was killed by God. Blood was shed. Okay, because the Bible says without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. Unless there is shedding of blood, you cannot be forgiven. So he shed the blood of these animals and he clothed Adam and Eve. 
and he set an example of what will be happening when you sin. And now remember, Adam was in a fallen state. He, uh, he had uh, lost the, the spirit of God. So he was two out of three parts. Remember, we have three parts, body, soul, and spirit. So the spirit died. He did not die literally there and then, but the spirit died. So he was in a fallen state, two out of three. And uh, actually, that's why you, when you divide two out of three, you get 0.666, which is, you know, the fallen uh, nature of man. So even the seed of Adam was also in a fallen state. When you go to uh, the book of, um, let me just read it for you. In uh, Genesis chapter five, verse three, it says how the children of Ab uh, uh, the children of Adam were like. They were in a fallen state. Look at this. Uh, Genesis five, verse three, it says, and Adam lived 130 years and begat a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth. Now, Adam is getting a child in the image and likeness of a fallen man. So now he was in that fallen state. And uh, what really happened was this. Now, as the days went by, we see the children of Adam, they are, they are going to call upon God. And uh, uh, there was Cain and Abel. Cain went and decided he will give God the works of his labor. You see that this was the, a good example to show that God is not interested with your works. He's interested with sacrifice, the blood, because the blood is the only way you can make a, a, an atonement for your souls. Leviticus 17, 11, it says, uh, the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given you the blood upon the altar to make uh, atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. Why? Because where blood has been shed, it means uh, there is uh, something has died. That sin or whatever has been there has come out, all right? Now let's go back again. So Cain and Abel, Cain went and decided, I'm going to give God uh, my watermelons, my oranges, my, you know, ho-ho, spinach, whatever, my works of my labor, you know, my beetroot. God, this is all that I've worked and I want to sacrifice them for you. What did God do? He said, I don't, I don't want your works. I don't want your good works. I don't want all those things that you're saying. I'm a good man. I've cultivated. I've done all these things. I've helped the poor. I've helped the need. I don't want these things. I want you to come to me the way you're supposed to come to me. So look at Abel. Abel, he went and sacrificed an animal. Blood was shed. So that blood pleased God because it was a type of showing this is how you're forgiven your sin. I will cover your sin through blood. So now Abel, his sacrifice was accepted. And as we go on and as we go on, we see sacrifice and sacrifice. We see Abraham, we see Moses, we see all this time. It was a type of sacrifice through blood. And also God in the commandments, he commanded Moses and told him, if any person sins, this is what is going to happen. They have to come with an innocent lamb, a very innocent kind of lamb or whatever. Bring the young, tender, the one that you look at it and you say, why do you have to kill this one? It's so tender. It's so innocent. It is like a way God was trying to say, when you sin, this is how I feel. You see the way you touch that animal and you see, why am I killing this? So innocent. So, so innocent. That is how God feels. So now he said, bring that lamb and come with it to the altar and then hold it like this and then cut the throat of that animal, that innocent animal. And as the blood is dropping down, then the priest will come and, you know, uh, with, a, with, a, with a cup or with a whatever, he will put the, the blood there and go and sprinkle it in the altar. And you will believe that this blood which has been shed was supposed to be your blood. Okay, that was supposed to be your life, which has come out, but you have used another innocent animal just to take that position of your sin. And it happened over and over again. But now the problem was this. These people are sinning every day, morning and evening, morning and every time. So, and you see with this uh, sacrifice of an animal, it could not forgive completely sins. You are forgiven up until today. You have sacrificed today. Then your sins, all your past sins have been forgiven. It is what we call remission. It was called remission of sins. So you are forgiven up to today. 
But now, as you're coming out from that altar and you go and, uh, you know, do something wrong again, you have to come back again with another lamb. So it was a tedious affair and uh, it was really very hard for people to maintain. And God looked and he said, I have to find a good permanent solution so that these people might be, might be forgiven once and for all. And then now God, the father decided to send Jesus Christ to come and become the lamb of God. All right. Now that's where we see God, uh, Jesus being called the lamb of God. Why is he being called the lamb? Because now he has to be done the same way, like those lambs, they used to be done. And that's why you see John the Baptist, when he saw Jesus coming to be baptized, he looked at him and he said, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. So he would be sacrificed as an innocent who has done nothing. He's so pure. He's done nothing to anyone. He'll be sacrificed again. And that blood of him, which is coming out, could have been your blood. The life which was coming out of Jesus could have been your life. But then Jesus was to be sacrificed the same way as that lamb has been, sacrificed, has been sacrificed before so that he can take away your sin. But now the beauty of Jesus is that for him, he did not only give us re a, a remission of sins, but he gave us redemption. So redemption, it means he took our past, our present, and our future sins. So Jesus died once for everyone. So he's not going to die again and again and again like those lambs that were dying before. No, he died once. And you remember when Jesus was at the cross, after he shed his blood, he shed everything and he was about to die. He said, it is finished. And then he died. So what was finished? The payment of the sins of everyone in the world. So Jesus forgave everyone in the world. So now if he has already forgiven you, he forgave you, He's forgiven Hitler. He's forgiven even the most corrupt person in, in Kenya and the whole world. He's forgiven everyone in the world. There's no one who is not forgiven right now. But why are people not going to heaven if we have all been forgiven? It's because people have never believed that they have been forgiven. It's because they have never believed in the person who has forgiven them their sins. They have never believed in that blood which was shed that that blood could have been their blood. And then they believe in the blood of Jesus for the remissions of their sins. You see how salvation is so simple and how salvation is all about the change of mind. So if you believe that Jesus, his blood was for your salvation, then you are saved. That's why Romans 3.25, it says, in whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood. So who has God said to be a propitiation? Jesus has been set by God the Father to be a propitiation, to be a substitute through faith in his blood. Unless you believe in this blood, then you can never be saved. Are you seeing the true gospel? Are you seeing why people are falling away into another gospel of ask Jesus into your heart? Now, how do we ask Jesus into our hearts? Back in the days when that lamp was being slain back in the times of Moses. Were you telling that lamp, lamp come into my heart? You see how people are confusing the gospel nowadays and they are falling away to some doctrine, which is not the truth. So the only way you can be saved is by you believing that this blood that Jesus shed was for your sins. And when you believe that, that Jesus died for your sins, he was buried. He rose again the third day, according to the scripture. You believe that his death, burial, and resurrection was for the sake of you. If you believe that, then automatically, immediately you get saved. And when you get saved, you get a new heart and a new mind. And now the Holy Spirit, when he's inside you, he starts leading you and telling you now, this is what you need to do. This is, this is the right way to pass. This is the right way. This is the right way. This is the right way. Are you seeing how the gospel is so simple? The gospel is found in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And it's very simple, childlike. The apostle Paul says, moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel. You see, which I preached unto you, which you received, and wherein you stand. So there are three parts here. You must have 
uh, he must have you must hear someone preach for you the gospel you must receive that gospel and you must stand on that gospel and he continues by which also you are saved if you keep in memory what i preached unto you unless you believed in vain now look at that point uh, for 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 this is the gospel which saves you look the gospel is the one which saves you unless you have believed in vain. Believing in vain is what? Believing that there is something else that you can do apart from believing that the blood of Jesus is the one saving you. And you think that maybe there's something else that I can do. Maybe I can give to the poor. Maybe I can help the widow. Maybe I can give to the church. Maybe I can get baptized. Maybe I can do some good works and probably I'll get to heaven. Maybe because I go to church every Sunday and I never miss one day. I am saved. Maybe because I'm a good upright man, you know, it makes me get saved. That is believing in vain. If you believe in yourself and believe in other things, then the cross, you make it of none effect. Then Jesus died for nothing. Why did Jesus have to die if you can enter heaven through your works? Are you seeing the difference? If Jesus died for your sins, then believe that he died for your sins. And that's the gospel. So if you believe there's something else that you can do, then it means Jesus did not have to die anyway in the first place. Why would he have died and you can just be a good man and go to heaven? You see the essence of why people are preaching another gospel and people are falling away to another gospel and they are teaching something literally very different. They are teaching you other things that you cannot even really comprehend. Others are telling you, just believe in Jesus. Now, let me ask you, when I tell you believe in Jesus, what actually are you believing? You see, the Bible tells us the devils, even the devils believe and they tremble. They know that Jesus is God. They believe that Jesus is God. They are very, are they saved? No. They only know that he's God and he's powerful and they tremble. You see, if you just tell somebody, believe in Jesus, then uh, he may be believing in Jesus as the Messiah. They may be believing in what now? Now, it, it means they are making the blood of Jesus of none effect. Because if Jesus could have been strangled to death, could there have been salvation? No. If Jesus could have died with a heart attack, could there be salvation? No. If Jesus could have been electrocuted, drowned in water, fallen from a cliff down and broke his neck, could there be salvation? No. But until Jesus shed his blood, because they, without shedding of blood, there is no remission or forgiveness of sins. It was really important for Jesus to shed his blood for you to be forgiven because that blood which was being shed was for the forgiveness of your sins. That could have been your blood going down, but Jesus shed that blood and now you have been saved, all right? So now when somebody tells you another thing that, oh, just believe in Jesus, just do right, just do whatever, just be a good man, noble man, do whatever you want to do, then he's preaching to you another gospel. And you have not been saved. Because unless you understand, because salvation is all about you, you first understand that you're lost. Somebody is sleeping, he can never really understand that he's asleep. Somebody is asleep, unless he wakes up, that's the time he will realize, oops, I was asleep. Unless you realize that you've been lost, then it's very difficult for you to be saved. Then after you understand that you're lost, then you look for the gospel. You tell God, please show me the truth. Show me the gospel. I'm lost. I can't help myself. I can't save myself. I don't know where the truth is. Show me the truth. And after God shows you the truth, which is in the gospel, don't just read the verse and then say, oops, that is it. No, understand the gospel. Unless you understand the gospel, you can never be saved. You can cram the whole Bible. You can cram from A to Z. You can cram the gospel. If somebody asks, what's the gospel? First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, you read it all. You can cram it and yet you're not saved. Why? Because unless there is an understanding, remember what that First Corinthians 15, 1 through 4 says. It says, if you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you believed in vain. Now, Paul is telling us, we keep in memory this gospel. We understand. Remember when you were in school? And a teacher could find you trying to cram uh, maybe uh, a formula. And he could tell you, please don't cram. Understand this formula. Because when you understand this formula, it's the only time when it can stick in your mind. 
But if you have just crammed, if an exam comes and uh, something else happens, you will fail terribly because you have not understood. That's the reason you see in church, people who have not understood the gospel, they say that they are backsliding and they are falling away and people are falling away. People have always been in church, even pastors and bishops. You will see it happening. People falling away and falling away. And you ask yourself, what happened? That pastor was a really great man. Oops, he was caught in a lodging with some chick. And what really happened? You will see some great men and you hear that person stole from this and this and this. You mean that guy was saved? No, he was not saved. He probably just knew the gospel, but never understood the gospel. Because once you understand exactly what happened on that day, how Jesus saved you, and you analyze it promptly very well, then that's the only time that you can be able to be saved. A good example. Do you remember the time of the Pharisees? And what Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses the righteousness of the Pharisees, you will in no way enter the kingdom of heaven. Remember that? Why? Because the Pharisees, they were the teachers of the law. They were religious leaders. They knew everything about the, the word of God. But how comes Jesus was saying that these people know nothing? They only clean outside, but the inside is so bad. It is because these people, they only read and crammed the Bible. They read and crammed and they knew the law from their minds, but it was never in their hearts. That's why Jesus came, the Redeemer. And instead of seeing that this is the Redeemer we have been looking for, the one we have been reading in the scriptures all through, instead of seeing that, what happened? They saw, ah, this guy is coming to take over our ministry. They killed Jesus. They killed the son of God. They killed the redeemer. You see, because they never understood the gospel. But if only they had understood the gospel and understood, wow, this is the person who has been prophesied. This is exactly the one who is coming to give us salvation in this way. Then they could have been saved. But they only had a good looks out here, you know, walking in, in streets and towns with long robes and, you know, everybody calling them teacher, teacher, teacher. When you see most of the pastors and bishops, they're just walking around and say, you know, they just want to sit in high places and be called great names. And most of them, just anytime when you sit with a pastor down, just always ask them, pastor, how is someone saved? what is the gospel where do we find the gospel in the bible and if they start telling you about you know just believe in jesus you see the gospel is the whole bible there you go you know that's a false convert he doesn't know what he's talking about because the bible tells us very clear it is all about the blood from the beginning and it is the blood of jesus that we speak about which saves us through believing so if they tell you Come in another way to God. You know, just come to church. Just do good. Just be this guy, kind of guy. Don't believe them. They are preaching to you another gospel. And the Apostle Paul told us here in the book of Galatians, he told us about this new gospel which would come. He says in Galatians chapter 1, verses 6, it says, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you in, uh, into the grace of Christ, and to another gospel. Paul is saying, I really pity you guys. Very, very soon you'll fall away. Somebody will tell you, no, 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 this is not how you're supposed to be saved. Forget the blood of Jesus. Just come. There's another way that you can enter. Remember Jesus said, he is the only way. But so soon, Paul says, I, I wonder and I feel bad. So soon you'll be removed from this and be taken to another gospel. And listen to this. Verse 7 says, which is not another it's not actually another gospel. They will not say at you, oh, believe in Satan. No, it's not really another gospel. They are talking about Jesus. Eh? But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Are you seeing this picture? These people, they are not really saying worship Satan or worship a tree or worship something. No, they are saying worship Jesus. But is another twisted, perverted gospel, which is slightly away and specifically out from the gospel of the blood of Jesus. Like look at this many, many, many churches which talk about, um, you see, 
uh, stay in holiness, like this uh, prophet Awar, he talks about holiness, holiness. You know, you have to be holy to enter the kingdom of God. Fine. But how do you become holy and you're not saved? You see, it is Jesus, it is the Holy Spirit who leads us into living a holy life. Actually, the Bible says, to whom who is able to keep you and to maintain you blameless unto that day. So he's, the Holy Spirit is the one who keeps you without sinning, without doing wrong things. So how do you live holy by your own power? You see, most of these pastors, they tell you, come on, hey, brother, you sinned. You do this. Hey, you're a... Why are people sinning in church? It's because they have never understood the gospel. The moment you understood what Jesus, understand what Jesus did for you, then boop, it will be like a bulb in your head. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit will come inside you. Most of these people who are always continually doing wrongful things is because they don't have the Holy Spirit in them. Because the Holy Spirit will convict you to doing what is right. Now, look at this. Look at this. Something really simple. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 4.30, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit by which you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. So it means the Holy Spirit being inside you, when you do something wrong, he grieves. When you go to uh, maybe some parties where people are doing wrong things, you will feel, oh, I'm, I feel bad. I feel bad doing these things. When you're watching weird movies, bad movies, you're like, oh, the Holy Spirit is grieving inside you. It is not you who is having these feelings. It's the Holy Spirit who is grieving inside you. So a born again Christian can never enjoy sin. He will try to sin. Sometimes he'll find himself sinning, but he can never enjoy sin. The Holy Spirit, remember, he does not condemn us. He convicts us unto righteousness. And the reason these people will do sinful things, you remember the scandal of Jimmy Swaggart? After so many years of sleeping with prostitutes in the, in the roadside and doing so many things, one day he was caught. And then he said, oh, I've, I've messed, I've done something really wrong. Oh, it's just happened. Oh, it's Satan, it's Satan. Let me tell you, for all that time he's been sleeping with prostitutes. Let me ask you, do you think the Holy Spirit was inside grieving? Can you ask yourself, was the Holy Spirit inside grieving? No, there was no Holy Spirit. Probably he was a false convert. And this one really happened so many times. People become false converts and they're in church. And you think, I'm going to heaven because, you know, I go to church. You know, I was told to repeat that prayer. I repeated Jesus come into my heart. You know, how many want to ask Jesus into their hearts? Yeah, I want to ask him. Yeah, Jesus come in. Do you think that's how people are saved? No. Salvation is through believing. Now, if salvation was about the word of your mouth, then it means all deaf and dumb people will go straight to hell. Why? Because they can't speak. They can't speak. They can't say anything. So they will go to hell because they never spoke those words, because they never said the sinner's prayer. No, salvation is from the heart. It's from the heart. You have to believe. Paul says, I believed, therefore I spoke. You believe, therefore you have spoken. The moment you believe, you have spoken. Actually, in Romans 10, I think 10, 13, the place where we see and uh, confess with your mouth, you're confessing what already you have believed. It's like you've seen a, a very beautiful lady there and you want to marry her and you go and tell her, hey, I love you. And then now you start loving them. Now, is that how things work? Do you tell somebody, I love you, and then you start loving them? Or do you love them first, and then you go and confess what you felt? That's exactly what salvation is. You first believe from your heart, and then now you can confess. It is just like baptism. Many people think that baptism, you know, saves or anything, or baptism is of any importance. No, baptism by water is of no importance. Actually, when you get inside water, all you do, you just come out wet. Because the Bible tells us that we are baptized with Christ by believing, by faith. Look at Colossians 2, 10 and 11 and 12. We are told we are baptized with Christ and also are risen with him through faith. So when you go to be baptized in the water, it is just an outward, an outward way of saying, hey, guys, look at me. I believed in Jesus. You know, I believed in Jesus and I died with. It's just like you're confirming to the world what you've already believed. It's the same way like saying it from your mouth.
Are you seeing the picture? So for those who think because I'm being baptized, because I'm saying a sinner's prayer, I'm saved, then that's where you find that you're really missing out on something. So you have a false conversion. And Galatians uh, chapter 1 verse 8, it says, but though we, listen to what Paul is saying, but though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Why is he saying this? Because there are other people will come and say, oh, the angel of God, I met this angel last night. He came and he told me this is another way to get saved. There's another simpler way. Just do this, you know, go to God, you know, in a certain way. Those are liars. Don't listen to them. Paul says, even if me, Paul, I come back again with another gospel, apart from Jesus dying for your sins and the blood of Jesus being the one for your forgiveness of your sins. If I come with another gospel, do not even believe me. Don't believe me. So you see, the falling away, people are falling away from the truth which they once believed. People used to say, Jesus uh, uh, loves you and, uh, you know, he died for you. He shed his blood for you. Nowadays, what are they saying? Oh, yeah, just there's a simpler way to do things, the sinner's prayer. There's a simpler way to do things, you know, baptism, coming to church every Sunday. You know, just you'll be blessed. You know, the blessing of Abraham, the blessing of this uh, prosperity. Remember, the blessing of Abraham was not money. The blessing of Abraham was justification through faith. He was told that there is a seed which will come from you. Who would justify the whole world through faith? And that seed is Jesus Christ. And everyone will be justified, will become your, you'll become your child. You'll, have, you'll be a father of many nations. And that's a promise he was given. You will be a father of many nations. Through a certain seed who will come from you, from your lineage, who will justify the whole world through faith. So the blessing of Abraham was justification through faith. But now people have changed it. And they say just a uh, blessing of Abraham was money and wealth. And because those prosperity people, they all they want is your money. Filthy lucre. All right. Now, let's continue. Let's see something here in 1 Timothy 4, verse 1. It tells us something about these apostasy times. Okay. It says these latter times. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. It says, now the spirit ex speaketh expressly. Express. The Spirit says expressly that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. You see, people will depart from that faith of the blood, the way they used to believe in the blood, giving heed to seducing spirits. You know, there are spirits which seduce people and doctrines of devils. Now, you think Satan doesn't have his own doctrine? He has. And his ministers, they, only, they also transform themselves. The Bible says, Satan masquerades as an angel of light. No marvel, even his ministers, they are also the same way. They are also pretending like, hey, we're angels of light, hey, but they have some doctrines of devils. Verse 2, speaking lies in hypocrisy. You hear? Those days, people will be speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Have you ever seen the way people do to horses? They, they put a hot iron on the, you know, on their, on their, on their leg, you know, they sear it with a hot iron until now, even when you're putting something is, is not, is, is like they are, you're purged, you purged yourself, you're purged yourself until now you no longer even feel anything. It's like when you start stealing. You still, they want your shake, you're shaking and you're scared. Day two, you shake a little bit. The third day, you're like, mm. the fourth day, your conscience is already seared like with an hot iron. You don't really care. You're like, mm, let it be the way it will be. I don't care. You see, that's exactly how people will be like. Having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Forbidding to marry, is this one happening? Have you seen people forbidding others? from marrying have you seen catholic church telling people don't marry you're you're a priest don't marry you know priests should not marry and commanding to abstain from meats have you seen this one happening every friday you cannot eat meat because uh, you see the catholic is saying eating meat i don't know what's wrong with that sda they're also telling people don't eat some types of foods why the bible is saying here commanding to abstain from meats, which god has created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. 
So everything is acceptable to you. You can eat the way you want. Because as long as you pray and you tell God, thank you for this, blessed you. Because everything was created by God. But people, they are coming up with some doctrines and say, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this. Don't. Because these are doctrines of devils. Verse 4, for every creature of God is good. Every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Even if you go to a place and people are eating grasshoppers, it's fine. Eat them. Just pray. Tell God, you know, everything of yours is good. God, I thank you for this. Bless you. You see? Look at this. Uh, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Everything you take is sanctified. By, but people don't want that. Now, look at verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto has attained. If you tell people these things that don't worry about this, don't worry about that, don't worry about these doctrines of devils, people are changing from believing in the faith and starting to tell you, do this, do that, do this, don't touch meat, don't do this, don't marry, don't do. They're starting to come up with other doctrines. But to you, you turn away and you tell them, no, that is not the truth. That's not the gospel. Then you're a good minister. All right? That you're being a good minister. Now, let's look. After you have told people about all this, there are some people who will come up and they'll say, oh, Keith, you're fake. Or oh, prophet. Oh, I mean, not, not prophet. Or uh, brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so. No, you're lying. These are not the last days. You see, there are so many people are saying, these are not the last days. You're just confused. You're a conspiracy theorist. Hey, you just think, you just think there's nowhere people are going. Blah, 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 blah. The Bible has already talked about these people. Let's look at 2 Peter 3, 1 to 4. 2 Peter 3, from verse 1 to 4, it says, this second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. I want to make you remember. Peter is saying, this one I'm writing to you, I just want you to remember because it will happen. And when you see it happening, no, those are the days. It's happening. It's there. Verse 2, that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets. Be mindful of those who are Jesus speaking, spoken by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So you be mindful. You remember very well which was spoken by the prophets and also by the apostles in the church age. Now, this is it, verse 3. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers. Are you seeing scoffers? scoffers walking after their own lusts now these last days you will see scoffers oh kate you're a liar there are no last days hey you're just scared hey conspiracy conspiracy theory blah 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 blah. you will see people saying mm, these are not last days and the bible has told us these are last days and everything is already put in place people are falling away to another doctrine and people are believing in other things and you tell them it's the last days my friends they don't want to hear why because the bible already said knowing this first that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? Have you seen people saying that? Oh, we had in 1988. Hey, in 2000, they said Jesus is coming. Hey, 205, they said Jesus is coming. 207, they said Jesus is coming. They said Jesus is coming. Where is the promise of his coming? 2020, we were told Jesus is coming last year. Now this year, you want to tell us Jesus is coming? Hey, where is the promise of his coming? These are the last days. The Bible said they will be saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. You see, that's what people say. Ah, back in the days of our forefathers, we used to hear that Jesus is coming. We don't really care about your story. You know, go and tell it to the birds. That one makes you understand we are in the last days. And the falling away is actually happening. It's happening 100%. We can see. Now, let's look in the book of Jude. Jude also has spoken about the same thing. He says in the book of Jude, uh, uh, chapter 1, verse 17 to 21, it says, But beloved, remember ye 
the words which were spoken before of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember those words. How that they told you there should be mockers in the last time who should walk after their own godly lusts. You see, they are walking after godly lusts. Now, why is the Bible saying godly lusts? Because they seem as if they are so godly. No, 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 come on. I have a master's degree from, you know, theo theological college, and I know, and I know. You, have you ever realized that most of these people say they know, they know nothing? They have only godly lusts. They just want, no, 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 Jesus is not coming anytime soon. Let's just go and uh, do this and do that and do that. Come on, give us some money to, we have to do this. Because they are last, all that they want is the money. They can't imagine that Jesus is coming and will finish our ministry. Ooh, I needed the money. I needed this. I need, you see, that's exactly what happens. These people, they are going after their godly lusts. All right, mockers. They are uh, 19. This be they who separate themselves, sensual, having not the spirit. You see, this kind of people, they don't have the spirit of God. Because if you had the spirit of God, he would uh, convict you to righteousness. He could have told you, no, no, come on, brother. Why are you scoffing another brother? Why are you scoffing another sister when she says the end time is near? When she says, do not take the mark of the beast. Why are you scoffing? The Holy Spirit will speak inside you. But when you see these scoffers, and they are from the church, then the Bible says they have not the spirit of God. They don't have the spirit of God. <laughs> Absolutely. They are not saved. They're just members walking in the church. We're just, hey, brother, brother, we are together. But at the end of the day, what will Jesus tell them? Remember what Jesus said? He said that in that day, many will come telling me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy? Did we not do great and mighty things? Did we not do this? Did we not do that? And he will tell them, depart from me, you that work iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew you. Why is he saying that I never knew you? Because these people, my brother was trying to call me. I'm here. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to return back again here. Now, listen, Jesus will tell them, I never knew you. Why? Because you people, all the time that you're in church, you have never had a relationship with me. All the time when you're in church, it was all about this and this and this. You remember even in the Bible, it says in the church of Laodicea, that that day, that church, Jesus is knocking at the door and say, please open for me. You're, you're praying me. You're, you're worshiping me without me in. Come on. That is a church which is false and fallen, which has fallen into apostasy into apostasia. They are falling into another gospel. They are preaching prosperity. They don't care about, you know, the things of God. As long as, you know, their God is their belly. That's what the Bible says. Let's continue in verse 20 in the book of Jude. It says, but ye beloved, building up yourselves on the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Keep on the Bible says, keep on. <laughs> what you're doing, keep on. Don't worry about scoffers. Don't worry about people who have fallen away. Don't worry about people who don't even understand the gospel. Don't worry about these people who say, you have to do this. You have to come to our church. Hey, brother, I never saw you in church for uh, two, three Sundays. Hey, you're, you're backslidden. You're backslidden. That's what people have always uh, been saying to others. You're backslidden. I never saw you in church. Who do you give tithe nowadays? Eh? You're falling, yeah? No, they are the ones who have fallen. Because the, Paul says, one man lifts one day above the others, and another one decides to lift all days up, uh, be, be, to, to be big. He decides that. So you do whatever you think is, is right. If you think, uh, I want to go to, you know, I want to do what is right, do whatever is right. Whichever day that you find is uh, fine, continue. Because the Bible is so clear about this. All right. The Bible is so clear about this. Let's let's see also. Have you ever heard perilous times will come in the last days? And this is how you know they are perilous times. Perilous times are really tricky and weird times. Second Timothy 3 1. Second Timothy 3 1. It says something here. Uh, actually go to verse, uh, all the way to verse 8. It tells us about the perilous times. And this is how you'll know that <laughs> Jesus is about to come for sure. Absolutely, 100%, he's about to come. Look at this. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. 
This know also that in the last days, perilous times shall come. In the last days, perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Are you seeing this one happening? People, they love themselves so much. Others, they say, as long as it makes me happy, I'm good. I don't care about other people. You know, whatever, they can do what people love themselves. Covetous, they, they covet things. Boasters, proud, blasphemers. People are blaspheming the name of God every day. The name of Jesus is being used like a curse word nowadays. When you do something evil, you just shout the name of Jesus. You're blaspheming the name of God. Disobedient to parents. Have you seen this one happening? Unthankful, unholy, without natural affection. All right? Natural affection, there is none. Truth breakers, false accusers. Are people accusing others? Are you seeing this one happening? People are accusing others for nothing. Incontinent, fears, despisers of those that are good. Nowadays, if you're good, people will despise you like no man's business. Keith, eh, nowadays, eh, he's preaching to people. Eh? Just the other day, he was drinking and, uh, you know, and uh, doing all those evil things. Eh? And we still see his post on Facebook. Eh? He was, he's, that, that guy is so, <laughs> look at him. He's now pretending he's become a preacher. He's now pretending that he's a good guy. That is exactly what people will be doing. They despising everyone who is good. They despise whoever. They don't care as long as they want people to be like them. Nowadays, when you tell people, hey, no, no it's okay, I, I, I don't drink, uh, no, I don't smoke. Ah, you don't smoke, you don't drink. You don't do these things. You're, you're so different. Why, why are you not doing these things? You see? Because people despise what is right. People despise what is right. They despise, okay? Let's continue. Traitors, people are traitors. Hardy, hardy. High-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. They love pleasure so much more than God. Having a form of godliness. Now, again, the gospel comes here. They have a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. The Bible is saying, these people will have a form of godliness. They, if they look as if they are saved. Have you ever gone to a Catholic church? And I like to quote them so much because they're the... They're, 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 they are the biggest uh, false doctrine out there, which is taking so many people. So these people, they have a form of godliness. They look as if you, have you ever seen those priests moving, going to the altar? You know, they see, they look like holy of holies. They have a form of godliness, but they deny the power of God. They say you have to do works. You have to be baptized. You have to do that. The church saves you. If you're not a member of the church, then you're not saved. Come on, they are despising the blood of Jesus. They, they are they are stepping on the blood and saying, it's of, non, it's of none effect. Are, are you seeing the point? And even any other church which just says, oh, the blood of Jesus is nothing. That's exactly what the Bible is saying here, that they love a form of godliness. And this one has also come to even Pentecostal churches there, Baptist churches there. Most of these, even these uh, uh, a little bit better churches, you will still find them there. It's happening everywhere. People now, they worship money, they worship things, they worship this, they worship pastors. Yesterday, I had a, a very big uh, debate, I think yesterday or today, in our uh, Bible study WhatsApp group. Some people are just so much on this Awar guy. Hey, you see, Awar said this, you have to fear this man, this man, without this man, you cannot enter heaven. I'm like, dude, who said Awar is on taking people to heaven? Because what did he say? He's a leader now, huh? Is to is is all of a sudden become Elijah. I asked them, okay, prove to me. They say, yeah, yeah he's Elijah. Do you know those guys who uh, listen to our prophet award? They think he's Elijah. You see how people can be doomed and fooled. They think he's Elijah. <laughs> I was just laughing and asking them, okay, prove to me he's Elijah because Elijah and Moses will come. So where is Moses? No, he's both Elijah and Moses. You know, one is tall, one is. Just go and listen to those uh, messages by Prophet Awar, and there he has deceived that big church of theirs. And uh, they say, oh, he has done some miracles. You see, he has done this. He even called the rain and called it fire. You know, look at what the Bible says in the book of Revelation that the beasts will be so cunning with all deceivableness that he will call fire from heaven in the sight of men, and he will deceive them 
because of those miracles. <laughs> Don't be fooled by miracles. Don't be fooled by people coming up and saying, oh, I prophesied this, I did that. If they don't follow the word of truth, the Bible, if they don't follow and they don't believe in the gospel, I ask to those guys, please show me one, one video, one video, send me one video where that prophet of war, the mightiest prophet as he calls himself, show me one place where he's telling people this is the gospel. This is how people are saved. All that he keeps on telling people is be holy, repent, holiness. How now do you become holy and you don't even know the gospel? How will you repent and you have not even understood what is repentance? Unless you explain to someone, how will they hear without a preacher? And this preacher who they have is not telling them the truth. Are you seeing the point? The Bible says, expose these people. Don't, don't keep on saying, oh, don't touch the anointed. Who anointed them? You have to open up your eyes. Let's continue. Verse 6. For this sort are they, these kind of people, these fake people, people, religious leaders, for this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lust. Have you seen so many women, so many women are deceived in churches nowadays. They are falling and they are bubbling something. They say, oh, it's a, you know, fire, fire of the Holy Spirit, blah, 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 blah. And they're speaking in tongues and run, rolling up and down because the Bible says these are Silly women who are being taken out, led by these people, okay, into some diverse lust. When they are falling, I, I saw so many churches where women are falling, they are raising up their, uh, their, their legs, you know, they, they, they are naked in the, in, the, in the church, and people are like there, and children are there, and they're watching, they're saying, oh, that is, that is uh, the, the, uh, uh, Johnny's mother, that's, that's Peter's uh, mother, what? that's the auntie, whoever, look. Her dress is up. She's falling in the spirit. Do you think God is the author of confusion? God is not the author of confusion. And the Bible keeps us on telling us all the time, be sober, be sober, be sober. Be sober. People falling down and scrolling like insects and like snakes and, you know, all those things that they do. They're not sober. They're not sober. The Bible is, God is not the author of confusion. That's confusion. After you've raised your legs, uh, you know, like this, and your children are watching you. Now, when you get back home, you tell them, oh, the Holy Spirit, oh, I, hope, I hope you never looked at me because the Holy Spirit, uh, oh, Holy Spirit confused me. Is God the author of confusion? No. No, that's a lie. Listen to this. Now, as Janus and Jambres with, withstood Moses, so do this also resist the truth. Men of corrupt mind, reprobates concerning the faith. These people are reprobates. They have fallen away. They are corrupt. They have corrupt minds. They don't even know what they're talking about. Verse 9. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men as theirs also was. Very, very soon, people will start, this is a fake, this is a fake, this is a fake, this is a fake. They're telling us wrong gospel, wrong doctrine. They are fallen, making people, they are blind people leading other blind people. So you will start seeing them and people will start opening up their eyes. You see? But there are, there are still people there who are still confused. Look at this uh, Pastor Nangas, look at this Pastor, Pastor, whoever, uh, the TB Joshua. People are just there. They are falling, uh, they are falling down. They are doing all those kind of things. And not even one day, do you know why I despise those people? Because not even one day will they, will you ever hear them speak the gospel? This is how someone is saved. They despise the blood of Jesus and they magnify prophecies. They say, oh, today is, every day is a prophetic day. Prophetic day. Today we are prophesying. I prophesy you'll get a car. I prophesy you'll have a big house. I prophesy you'll have a wife. I prophesy you'll be married this year. I prophesy. These guys, they keep on prophesying. They prophesy, they prophesy, they prophesy, and they'll prophesy you on your way to hell. You'll be prophesied till you see yourself in hell because you've never heard the gospel. You've been given another gospel because they have fallen away. They are apostates. Don't listen to those people. Open your eyes. The truth is found in the Bible. The truth is found in the gospel. And unless you know what the truth is, then you'll be fooled. You'll be like these people. At the end of the day, you will fall away to some fake things. And you'll be asking yourself, 
But God, I, I've been in the church all through. God, I, I was giving tithes. God, I was, I was prophesying. I was a good man. I tell you, depart from me, you that works in equity. I never knew you. I never one day had a relationship with you. Did you ever understand what I did for you? Did you understand that I died for your sins? I shed my blood for you? And you're here telling me that you gave to the church, that you gave to the poor? Why did I have to die in the first place if you can't believe in my blood? That is exactly what Jesus will be telling them. He'll tell you, depart from me with your works. Depart from me from, you think you took the blood that I shed at the cross, all that pain, all that hassle, everything. In vain, just because you gave, you thought your works can take you to heaven. You thought baptism can take you to heaven. You thought, and I said, I am the way, the truth and the life. I told you, I am the life. I told you, I am the way. Without me, you can go nowhere. I told you these things, and I told you, you did not listen. Oh, Jesus, I did not know. It is that pastor who fooled me. The same, same sin, which was with Adam and Eve. When Adam was asked, why did you eat the fruit? What did he say? You see, it's that woman who deceived me. It's not me. Eve, why did you eat that? You see, it's that serpent. It's not me exact thing which will be happening on that day of judgment it is not me it's my pastor mm -hmm. go to hell i don't care if he's your pastor or who because i told you to read the bible i did not tell you to believe a pastor i told you read the bible for yourself see but you never wanted to hear all right now let me con uh where um uh, let me just read this one more here it says uh, verse 11, uh, is it? Uh, yeah, verse 10. But thou hast fully known my doctrine. This is Paul saying, you have known my do doctrine. You've known the doctrine that I've taught you ever since. You have known my, my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith. You know what I believed in and you know what I told you to believe in the blood of Jesus, believing in the gospel. I told you, you knew my faith long suffering charity patience persecutions you knew how much i was persecuted afflictions which came to me at antioch and iconium and lystra what persecutions i endured but out of them all lord delivered me how many people right now if they go through persecution they can stand they'll say oh there's no god how comes right now this is happening oh i don't want to hear this i don't want to hear that you see you see People don't want to hear that. They, they want a good, smooth life because the prosperity churches are promised you. When you get saved, huh? God is going to give you a car. He's going to give you a house. He's going to give you healthy life. It's going, you know, it's like when you come to God, is God, where are my things? You, you, you told me, where's my car? I came here, God said, where is my car? That's what people think. They think that salvation is like a retirement plan. Is a like retirement plan whereby now, because I've been saved now, God, uh, I'm not seeing my car. It's, it's one year since I got saved. Where is my car, Pastor? Where, where is my house? You, you promised me. You prophesied. You prophesied that I, I'll, I'll be buying. You see? And at the end of the day, these people are rooted in a wrong doctrine. And when they start to try and grow, thorns, you know, they prick them and they die that seed cannot grow it cannot grow because it was not rooted in the right soil it was <laughs> it was thrown on some thorns and it was told hey it will not be prosperous and when they are choked by life they are choked by things and they can't see the promises you gave them they fall they fall away okay look at this let's continue here verse 12 yeah and all that I will leave, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Look, Jesus is saying, everyone who will follow Jesus truthfully will suffer persecution. You will be hated. You will be hated. You will be, uh, people will not want to hear anything from you. They will uh, see you're a bad person. They will say this and that. You, you, you will suffer persecution because, <laughs> come on, Jesus said, must uh, the servants are not above the master i was persecuted you will also be persecuted you will face trials and tribulations you will be beheaded you will be killed you look at this um, what is happening in the world 
Christians, everybody's against Christians because they don't want this, what is happening. They don't want it. They say, no, I will not take it. I will not take it. I will not take it. And they're told, you conspiracy theorist, you don't believe the scientists. You don't believe the scientists. You're a fool. Trust our scientists. And Christians are saying, I will not believe our scientists. I'll believe in Jesus. Jesus, my healer. He told me that he will heal me. I, even if he will not heal me, he is still my God. Like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, he will deliver me from that fire, from that persecution that you want. And even if he will not deliver me, he is still God. I'm not going anywhere. I will stand with the truth. Look at this, verse 13. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Evil people, they, they will continue being deceived and deceiving others and getting confused and every day doing whatever their heart pleases. And they will wax worse and worse, worse and worse. Well, don't think that these people will start becoming good. All of a sudden you start saying, oh, this person has become good. Hey, wow. wow. You see what people are waiting? Jesus said there will never be peace. Until Jesus comes. He said that I remember I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. I came to bring sword, not, not peace. For those who are saying, oh, I think when we take this thing, now there'll be peace in the world. When this guy comes to rule us, there'll be peace in the world. The, I saw uh, on the news, there was elections, uh, I think today or yesterday, and politicians were fighting. Others, they are <laughs> you look at a politician, his clothes have been torn, he's walking naked just because of a vote. And you think those are the guys who are going to help you get peace? Those guys who cannot help themselves, they are fighting themselves, they are tear gassing themselves, they are even almost killing themselves. Those are the ones who are going to give you peace? <laughs> you, must be, you must be lying to yourself. These politicians will not give you anything. There is no peace until Jesus comes. So you have to understand, you are either deceived or you're deceiving someone. And unless you have the gospel. Now look at verse 14. But continue thou in the things which thou has learned. Continue in the things that you have learned. And has been assured of. Knowing of whom you have learned them. And that from a child you have known the holy scriptures. Which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Through faith which is in Jesus Christ, you have known the Holy Scriptures. These scriptures are able to make you wise unto salvation. For those who say, my pastor is making me wise. He's the only one who can speak to me and tell me what God is saying. You are lying to yourself. You're believing in a man. And the Bible says, woe unto those who put their trust in men. <laughs> because those people, they are cursed. The Bible says they are cursed. Cast is the man who puts his trust in a man. You put your trust in a man, you're cast. But the Bible says, put your trust in the Holy Scriptures. Put your trust in the gospel. And when you search these scriptures, they are able to make you wise unto salvation. Through faith, which is in Jesus Christ. And it says, verse 16, all scripture is given by, by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So everything you need is in the Bible. Don't wait for another guy to come and say, oh, the, 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 the spirit showed me last night. You see, Jesus appeared to me last night and he told me, you see, you people, you don't understand. I saw Jesus face to face and, you know, he told me this. There's another guy on YouTube. He's called uh, prophet Sandu something, Salvar Sandu, just go and see, Sandu, D-H-U, -D something like that, some, some guy with some uh, long hair and he wears some robe, some orange robe, he's always saying how he's seen Jesus and how Jesus has come to him in his room and they discussed and Jesus went and the other day I saw him saying, oh, I went to heaven and I was just seated and you know, God calls some meetings and we went to that meeting with Trump <laughs> another liar false prophet don't listen to these guys listen to the bible listen to what he, the bible is saying these are liars they're liars they're liars they're telling you something which is not true because the bible says all scripture is given by inspiration of god is profitable for doctrine don't take your doctrine from a man for reproof to reprove anyone reprove him using this bible all right 
for correction, correct everyone using the Bible, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. You're, you're, you're cleansed, you're, you're made so neat for good works, all right? It, it said it's here, all right? And let me tell you, when you see these people mocking and saying all these things that they're saying, my friend, most of these people, they are antichrists. Don't wait for another antichrist. Antichrist, the main one is coming, but the, but the, the children of that antichrist, they're already out in the world doing weird stuff. Let's see. In the book of 1 John 2.18, 1 John 2.18, look at this. Listen to what the Bible tells us. Little children, it is the last time. And as you have heard that Antichrist shall come, have you heard about that, that Antichrist shall come? Even now, there are many Antichrists whereby we know that it is the last time. <laughs> so you're waiting for the big Antichrist. There are already smaller Antichrists out here who are already, you know, doing things the way, telling you, believe in another gospel, fall away with us, fall away with us. They're telling you, no, 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 just, just, just do this to be saved. But the Bible tells us, believe in the blood, believe in the gospel. And they tell, no, no, no just fall away with us. Because there's nothing like losing your salvation. There's nothing like backsliding. Those people who you hear they're backslidden, it's just a lie. They have never been with us in the first place. The Bible tells us, look, look at uh, the next verse here, verse 19 in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2, verse, nine, uh, verse 19. It says, they went out from us, but they were not of us. You see, these people, they went out from us. Those who say they are backslidden, they went out from us, but they were not uh, of us. For if they had been of us, they will no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Simple. These people who are falling away, they are going away because in the first place they are not with, they were never with us. And that's why Bible is saying in the last days, people will fall away, fall away, fall away. They are going into other doctrines and to other things and they are falling away, falling away. And you wonder what happened? Sister Mary, she was saved. What happened? Brother, what happened? This guy, these people, they went out of us so that it can be made manifest in the first place. They have never been with us. And unless you understand this aspect of falling away, it all comes with where have you put your stand? Have you put your stand in the gospel? Or is your stand, are you standing on something else? Remember 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4, where the gospel is. Paul tells us, this is the gospel by which you stand. And you stand by keeping in memory what he preached unto us. Paul preached unto us. He preached unto us what the gospel is. And he told us, stand on that gospel. Don't move an inch from that gospel. Hold fast what you have so that it will not be stolen from you. Believe in what you believed in the first place. Don't start changing. Don't start falling away. Don't start being like these people. Don't start behaving like the heathen. This is really easy to understand. The gospel is so easy to understand. The great falling away is coming. The apostasy is coming and people are falling, 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 falling away from the truth. Don't be like those people. Please, you can share this video so that other people can be able to uh, hear and learn because it's really important for people to hear this message and to be able to learn. God bless you and have a blessed time. See you on Monday.